What is going on everyone? Anthony Drew Gary here, host of The How To Show, where we talk about optimizing life, money, and happiness one how-to at a time. This week on the show, we're going to touch a little bit on the great resignation and what it could mean to you. Uh, did a little bit of research and in January, 4.3 million people quit their jobs. So the great resignation is still going strong. And though it may not be the only reason, I suspect a good number of folks uh, maybe quit their jobs to pursue an opportunity to make more money. And in the throes of that, I realized that I've never done a video before on how to negotiate your salary. And the good thing is I don't have to do this type of a video by myself. I am not the expert in that world, but I can bring on folks from my world who can better speak to these things. Enter Randy Brown. Randy and I uh, got together as uh, me being a, a Butler MBA student, and he was uh, assigned and paired up with me to be my leadership mentor. And Randy brings a great experience level for this sort of a discussion. Uh, he spent over a decade as the chief human resources officer for Anthem, which is a, a nationwide health insurance company. And so, Randy, welcome to the How To Show on a special episode of How to Negotiate Your Salary. Well, it's great to be with you, Anthony. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you invited and, and honored. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I really do. And so to, to get started in this, uh, this thought of negotiating your salary, usually that's not the first thing that you talk about when you're interviewing for jobs, when you're looking for jobs, but somewhere along the lines, either in your initial interview or maybe in a phone interview with a recruiter, at some point along the way, you're going to be asked how much money you want to make. And so what, what sort of an answer do you give to that question in, in a general sense without saying something that'll completely scratch you off the list? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, usually that shows up in two different forms. Sometimes it's in a, a pre-screening early stage question. And if you're asked how much money do you make, my advice is to tell them, uh, not be cagey about it. Usually when you're asked a fact-based question, it's to just see if it's worth continued exploration for both parties. So if they just wanna know how much you're currently making, I would say, tell them. Um, when, whenever you're talking to an employer and they ask you a fact-based question and you, you, you're a bit dodgy, it, it's not a good start to the dialogue. So um, it is what it is, give them the information if they ask for it. It's usually just to make sure there's a, a potential for a fit here. And you wanna know that too. I mean, by the way, don't limit yourself to base salary. So if, you, if they ask how much are you making and I'm making 50,000 in base salary, my target bonus has been 10%, uh, but I've been typically bringing home uh, 10K instead of 5K. You know, the answer is my base salary is 50,000. I have a 10% target bonus. But over the last couple of years, we've been uh, I've been earning more like 60,000. And if you have a unique kind of special benefit, um, don't hesitate to tell them about that, too. So let's say I got that question. And, and, and by the way, uh, my company is currently paying 50% uh, of my graduate level uh, classes, you know, throw in other forms of compensation. Don't just limit yourself to base salary. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting way to frame it and maybe a, a, a way to frame it that's, that's unique. I've, I've seen this question answered a lot of different ways. You know, you can you can tell them the truth. You can lie to them and potentially set up a, a, a interesting conversation along the way. And to, to maybe ask the question a different way, I can remember when my mother used to get angry at me for answering her question with a question. I'm curious to get your take. How do you feel if... Uh, if you're asked how much you want to make and you rebut that with, well, how much is budgeted? Yeah, is there is there some sort of gamesmanship that goes on there? And how do you feel about it? Yeah, that's a good point because I didn't I didn't actually finish your first question. So I'm glad you brought that up. The, the answer I gave you was if they ask what you're making now, but I didn't answer what if they ask what do you want to make? Yeah. Usually I like to try and put that question off till the end, until I have some leverage, until I know they want me. So early in the process, what I'd want to do is typically say, well, um, at the moment, um, I'm interested in competitive compensation for this pay. I'd love to explore the opportunity a little bit more until we talk, uh, and maybe we can talk about pay a little bit later. Or whatever way you feel comfortable with. It's okay to dodge the what you want question and try and put that off until the end. Because it's really tough early in the process to know what you should be asking for. You've barely 
learned much about them and you want them to like you a little bit more before you get into pay. Yeah, I think that's a, a great way to, to frame that is that you don't know enough to answer that question and you're being asked that question typically really early on, uh, right, wrong or indifferent as some sort of a screening mechanism. And so let's uh, let's take that a step further and uh, you know maybe a different way to ask the question how much you want to make is how much are you worth? And maybe there's becomes a, a level of imposter syndrome there as a, you know, maybe I, I feel like I'm worth X when in reality, the, the skills that I have or the capabilities that I have are 20% more than X or so right. how do you, how do you go about determining your worth in the marketplace in a, in a situation where, where maybe you don't know what that position you're after is, uh, is set up for from a pay range, but you want to, you want to try to research that a little bit. What do you, what do you recommend there? There's some, uh, the good news is in the last couple of years, some online tools that allow you to know what you're worth are, have gotten better. And one that I think uh, didn't used to be very good, but now is pretty good is something called salary.com, where you can actually go out and you can benchmark yourself in uh, established roles. You know, if, if, you ro- if the role is very unique, then it may be hard to find your match. But if you've got a job that other people do, project manager, um, my son and I had this conversation last year. He's a copywriter for an advertising agency in Chicago. And we were able to go to salary.com and look for three different, four different, five different levels of copywriter and really find out the, the description that was most like what he did and benchmark what his salary was for Chicago, right? And you can do it by different cities. So you can learn your market value by looking at online data that lets you pinpoint um, what you're being paid. And what, why that database has gotten better, it's self-reported. So you gotta be, you know, people, you hope they tell the truth and it's not, um, it's, it, it, there's, there's room for error in it. But the number of people who put the data in that database has now expanded to the point where it's relevant. Um, it's not just a couple of people reporting a few numbers. So usually you'll find a lot of good data and it's pretty close to what the market actually uh, pays. Yeah, I appreciate your referencing the website and the, its improvement over the years and to, to use some data points in your uh, in your corner to start to frame these sorts of discussions. So let's uh, let's continue on with the scenario you've interviewed. You've uh, found out that you like the company. The company likes you. You think this is a, a decent fit for you. And you, you get to the point where they decide, yeah, you're the guy, Randy. We want to bring you on. And so they they offer you a, a position and they give you a, a term sheet and it's got a, a base salary in it. Do you counter it no matter what? Not necessarily. Um, I'm a big believer in, um, well, first of all, let's say you've done your homework and you know what you're worth. And let's say you find it, uh, found out uh, that for the, the job you want, the market typically pays 50K and they've offered you 60K. Mm-hmm. Do you want to negotiate? Or what about other parts of the offer? Do you want to, if there's a bonus, do you want to talk about bonus? Um, if there isn't a bonus, do you want to talk about a, ability to participate in bonus? What about stock? What about benefits? What about paid time off? So, you know, if this, the, the, I'd say most people make the mistake of putting a little too much emphasis on base salary alone. It's the biggest part for most people at this, at the early stages of their careers, at least, and you want it to be right. Um, but you don't necessarily have to counter if you think what you're getting is, at or better than what you had anticipated. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. It all it, it's all relative to your expectations to the marketplace and, and a whole bunch of different scenarios there. And so let's uh, let's ask the question uh, maybe in a different scenario and the 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 essence of buyer's remorse. You know, we we've been using the 50k metric, and so this is this is something that I can appreciate from a past uh, experience of mine. What happens when you throw that number out to them and they give you exactly what you asked for? <laughs> <laughs> then I would say be glad. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I don't, um, you should, I, if they, if, if you've gotten to the point where you know you've done well and you've got the feel that they do want you and they do throw it back to you, then it is time to maybe name a number. Then it is time to say, you know, I, I was really, uh, I'm excited about this opportunity. I'd love to be part of your company. I'm established where I am. I really like it. And so to make a move, um, I was hoping to sort of go for a number more in the area of X and then ask for that slightly higher number. If it's a problem for them, remember, they already like you, right? And they'll want to work with you. 
So I've, I've almost never seen somebody lose a job because they stretched on what they were asked for if they were asked and the employer really did want them. All right. We're going to pause the episode right now. Go back and listen to that 30 seconds again. There are actionable tips line for line. You can take what Randy just said and probably use it in your own instance. And so highly recommend doing that. And that, that really leads me into the to the next step of this. Is there is or is there something in your experience, Randy, where you've heard a candidate say the correct assemblage of words that makes you just overwhelmingly want to throw more money at them? And I know that I know that's a crazy question to ask, but 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 speak life into the situation. Is there something like that that exists in your mind? Well, uh, yeah, there actually has been. Um, people underestimate this. So I'm coming at it from an employer's point of view. Yep. Nothing, nothing pleases an employer more than to be told that they're wanted. So it's, if it's at the end and I've signaled to you as the employer, Anthony, I'd love you. I'd love you to love you to work here. And you say, I am so excited about working here. I really am. You haven't given up any leverage but you've made them sort of want you even a little bit more. It's like, oh, wow, this is going to be wonderful. He wants it. We want it. It doesn't mean that they're going to take advantage of you unless they're a bad employer. And if they're a bad employer, you don't want to work there anyway. Um, it, it's a show the love and the employer will usually respond favorably. That's fantastic advice. I'm glad I asked that question in such a way that I got that sort of a response out of you. And this is good that you can play from both sides of the uh, the discussion here with your past experience and, and bringing folks on. And so let's uh, let's take another step at, at this. Uh, you're in a situation and you really want to make that 50, 50 grand. And the, the company that you're working for has offered you 45. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, that's that's where they're stuck. That's where they need to be. What, what, do you, what do you feel in there in that situation? Is it worth losing a good employee over five grand? And in the instant, instance that this happens, is this a red flag about a company? How do you feel about you know, let, letting good people walk over what in the grand scheme of things maybe isn't worth walking over? It's a great, great question. And, I, it, and it's very relevant because I've I work with uh, undergraduate students now. And so that happens all the time, um, especially for, you know, new grads don't have a lot of leverage uh, with employers. So what will happen is you'll maybe know that your market value is a certain number, but you've talked to an employee who can give you a very unique employment experience or employer, I'm sorry, give you a very unique experience. You get to do something you may not get to do other places. You may have more latitude, more responsibility, more creative freedom, whatever it is but the job itself is very, very attractive. Then you got to ask yourself, is it close enough that it wouldn't annoy me if I accepted this offer? Because usually when an employer offers you something and say, I'm at my max, I really can't move. There's something going on internally. They're worried about internal fairness. It's usually not a budget matter. It's they're, you know, they're paying Sally 45 and they just, you know, they don't want to alienate Sally. Should she ever find out that they're paying you more and they want to be fair. Mm -hmm. So I think, Sometimes it's worth taking an offer because the other parts are so compelling that you believe over time, this is a net win for you, but never take an offer where you're going to agonize that you've sort of undervalued yourself. If the number's going to annoy you, then walk away because yeah. pay is a satisfier. Pay is not a motivator. It's, a, it's either you're happy with it or you're not happy with it. And if it's going to annoy you, it's, it's that annoying feeling won't go away. There's a ton of great things you said there to unpack. And I, I think that maybe to start, the, this is going to look different in different points in your career uh, yeah. based on a leverage standpoint. When you're fresh out of out of school or fresh out of your trade, this is going to look different than if you're a, a five-year industry vet, a 10-year, a 15-year. And so it's good that you put that sort of a framework to it. And, uh, and it, it's also good to, in, in essence, what you did there is to suggest that somebody switches shoes for a moment and to appreciate that, uh, that on that hiring end, there is a level of internal fairness and then the expectation that, uh, that, that maybe they need to, to be contiguous with, uh, with some of the hires they've already made. And so it's, it's good to think about things from both perspectives like that. But uh, you, you started to talk a little bit about, basically, I, if I were to put words in your mouth, culture in lieu of economics. Uh, I think that's maybe how we say that. Well, how do you feel about that? How do you dance around the fact that, you know, maybe they offer a great experience, but they're paying their folks 
maybe not as well as uh, you could be across the street with a slightly less experience and, and, and get more dollars in the door. Well, uh, let me, uh, I would not let an employer get away with, you know, uh, we don't, we don't, we can't pay you what we want because the, the, the environment is so cool here. <laughs> I mean, that, that doesn't work. Um, however, however, there are times when, let's say it's a startup. And it's a really uh, early stage startup and they just truly can't afford to pay market yet. But you get in early at something and then maybe later you'll have the ability to earn stock in that startup or some, you know, if the payday you think could come later and the opportunity to learn something, do something, be part of something is so compelling, you know, careers are long. And so sometimes it's worth it to get in you know, and, and sacrifice one element of the employment experience like pay for the stuff you're going to get in that for that period of time. One last thing, and I'll be brief on this. I think this discussion matters to a lot, depending on where you are in your career. Early stage, right beginning your career, not a lot of leverage. Employers are going to try and line everybody up at about the same rate and then let the winners prove it on the job mid-career rising star like you, Anthony, you know, the, the, the pay starts getting uh, more important and you've got more leverage because you've got more experience. Um, and then later stage, um, you don't want to be compromising too much on pay in your 40s and 50s because, you know, those are the years when the real wealth creation for retirement ramps up. So I think it matters less early then it, it, where you just need to be competitive and more later when the dollars are bigger and when it matters more to your life plans. That's fantastic and a good way to, to sum all of that up. And so to, to take and, and get into to your expertise in the human resources role, I'd like to, to get a little nerdy if we can about the role of human resources in this entire recruiting process. And, and, and maybe this, this is a, uh, an instance where my personal experiences are going to start to drive these questions, but in the sense that there are recruiters and human resources folks and people in the onboarding process, you can get to a point in the process where it really feels like they are your advocate. Where in the flip side to this, the reality very well could be that in, and is that they work for the company and it is their job to perform a task and to fill a role. So how do you, how do you balance that, uh, that sort of feeling that they're in your corner while they're really not in your corner. And is there anything that you can do about that as a candidate to, to make sure that you're getting the best that a company can, can offer you? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, um, you know, when you have an advocate anywhere in the process, whether it's the hiring manager, that's the ultimate advocate or the HR recruiter, it's a good thing. And, and, you know, they're, they're usually being genuine about it. They, uh, let's be nerdy. That recruiter probably has 30 jobs at any one point in time to fill. If she likes you and th she thinks you're a good fit, she is going to advocate for you. She's going to try and influence that hiring manager to hire you. So it's, it's not fake or phony often. It's a desire to, uh, to get this one filled and move on to other things. And so um, not that they're trying to rush you or, you know, uh, it, 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 I didn't mean to apply that. It's just more the, the genuine interest in you is often not a game. It's actually genuine interest. And so to leverage that, uh, feel free, use it. I've, I've seen hiring managers influenced by recruiters who really could um, explain to them what the market is like for talent and say, you know, this guy's got something that's hard to find. Yeah, I, uh, I like the way that you assemble that there. And so to to take this one step further, let's let's describe a scenario where maybe somebody's uh, a little bit advanced in their career. They're making maybe seventy grand right now. Uh, they've done their homework and they get the anticipation or the thought in their head that you know maybe they're making seventy grand in a, a position where a similar type of role, similar type of company, similar type of geography is paying ninety five for that role. And so you uh, you start testing the waters. You you have a couple of interviews. And you find another company that's willing to willing to offer you eighty grand. How do you how do you build that courage internally to go and make that ask for that higher number based on the research you've done? Do you have any advice for somebody that's in that situation? Because I, I feel like in the the war on talent now that's ha that's happening, and I, I want to make an opportunity for you to to let out any more of your your secrets that you've seen over the last. Uh, several uh, years of your career to, to hopefully get some somebody to get some value out of it. 
I'd say it's a, it's a it's it's best to engage in a discussion about compensation before you have an offer or before uh, something serious has evolved with another employer. But for example, let's take your your point. I'm making 75. You think the market's more like 90? Someone calls me with an offer of at least 80 or more, and and I uh, tell them, you know, no, thank you. I'm very happy right now um, because maybe you you don't want that opportunity. It's certainly okay to sit down with your boss and say, boss, can I have a discussion with you? Um, I'm a little concerned about where I am. I feel like uh, I love, you know, your support for me. Tell them all the good stuff. I like you. I like the work you've given me. Don't make them think that you're really uh, bothered and ready to leave. Tell them what you like. But, you know, I'm starting to worry that I might be a little under market in my pay. And I'm wondering if we can have a discussion about that. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about where you feel my pay fits, at least internally? Um, and how does the pay system work? If I wanted to advance my pay here, uh, what advice uh, would you give me? So have it be a non-threatening, not gun to the head kind of a conversation. Um, if you come in and you've gone all the way down to the point where you've got another offer with another firm and it's for more money and you want to come back and say, unless you match this, I'm moving. That's, that's kind of like gun to the head negotiation. And it may work once, but it fundamentally changes the relationship. So I would say use that very sparingly. And if you get that offer, be prepared to take it. Um, I've, uh, I've rarely seen people um, take counter offers or, or employers respond to counter offers and match it unless they are willing to admit we've been negligent here. And if you have a, hum- a humble enough employer to say, you're right, we haven't paid attention, we're going to settle this then you probably, you're probably going to be okay. But it shouldn't take going that far in the process to the point where you have another offer to get your current employer to move. Yeah, and so I think what we're doing here is we're heading ourselves down a, a road to what, what I would call a bonus episode. And so maybe we've, uh, we've jumped ship a little bit on how to negotiate your salary and we get into the discussion of how to ask for a raise. And I think we just covered really well the aspect of you know, what that looks like if you're testing the market. Uh, but let's say you're in a situation where you're really happy with your employer, you have a good, good situation going, you don't wanna test that market. What, what sort of tips do you have? Uh, how, how do you ask for a raise, Randy? I'm, I'm curious to get your take on that. Yeah, well, number one, go in knowing that market value. Do your homework, salary.com or another reputable source. Know what you think you are worth. Um, have that non-threatening conversation first with your boss. Um, make it, don't be, don't uh, pick your time right. Make sure it's not when he's got five minutes and he's off to another meeting. You know, ask if you can have a discussion uh, and give yourself, you know, 20, 30 minutes to discuss it with him or her. And if she uh, or he doesn't know the answers, so just uh, thank you for listening. You know, they may have to do a little homework. They may feel a little awkward. But basically, your point is to say, I'm making 75 now. I've been treated fairly since I've been here. But I'm really performing, I think, at a pretty high level. I've gotten good feedback. I just love to know how I can grow my compensation. Can I grow it? Um, at What ways can I grow it within the current job? Is Are there ways to expand my current job and get more compensation? Or do I need to consider moving into a different role to increase my compensation? You, just, you know, find out how anyone advances in pay and then how you do. A general discussion of how it works here can be very helpful. And why I say that, large companies can be very different in that respect than small companies. A lot of times, large companies are very structured and have very regimented ways of handling pay. And it's usually so that they're fair uh, across the board and they don't stumble into unfairness across race, gender, different uh, categories of employees. Small companies can be very ad hoc. And sometimes they just don't pay enough attention to salary. And the very fact that you have the discussion can get them thinking about something that they just haven't bothered to think about. I am so thankful that I brought you on for this because this is an opportunity for you to articulate from all of your experiences something in a way that I could not put together that that succinctly, that fluidly. And so thank you for that. Again, if you're watching this, go back and rewind 30 seconds. You can take some of what Randy said word for word and apply it in your own life. It's really great stuff. So Randy, I appreciate you diving into the aspects of covering how to negotiate a salary. 
how to ask for a raise. If you've got a few more minutes, I want to ask you a few rapid fire questions known as the how to cues. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. I want to ask you the best book that you've read in the last 12 months. Oh, in the last 12 months. Um, I'd have to look on my shelf. It's uh, oh, why, why we're divided. Okay. Uh, it, and it's a book about like what's happened in America. Uh, and I can't remember the name of the author. He's a pretty famous guy, but it was a fascinating read. Very good. That's definitely Googleable. I appreciate it. Uh, what is one podcast you subscribe to? I guess a better question is, are you a podcaster? Um, not as often as I'd like to, but uh, when I do, I like Freakonomics. Okay. Yeah, that was a fantastic book. I've uh, listened to a few episodes as well. One of my favorite parts in there is that he, he did a bit where he talked about how after they changed the rules and tax forms, they had to submit social security numbers to claim dependents. A whole bunch of children mysteriously vanished the following year. It was one of the greatest things I'd ever read. And so I'm, I'm glad, glad that you referenced Freakonomics. Well, you, you talk about being geeky. Uh, when it comes to any book or podcast on behavioral economics, I'm in. There you go. I can appreciate it for sure. What is one app on your phone that you could not do without? find my phone yeah that'll do it <laughs> and appreciate the honesty there that's awesome yeah probably that one and uh and you know the standard stuff uh, uh texting uh email those, those kind of things i'm with you all right what is something that you've spent a hundred dollars or less on recently that has brought tremendous value to your life a hundred dollars or less on Tremendous value. This sounds, I, I, I wouldn't say it's brought tremendous value, but how about a little bit of joy? Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, I found this, this shirt uh, size and style that fits just right because I've been notoriously hard to find. They're either too long or too big or too small or whatever. I'm just like this tweener size. And then I finally found one that was just like it was tailor made for me. So I bought them. I bought one. It was under a hundred bucks. Yeah. Then I cheat, I'll cheat on your, and then I bought five more. Right. <laughs> I can relate to this way more than I should. I have the same golf polo upstairs and I think 14 different colors. I am yeah. all about that life. <laughs> yes. I've learned that they, they quit selling things uh, when you think they're going to be there forever. So buy them when you can. That's right. So that that's an awesome answer to that. All right. Last question, Randy. Where can people find out more about you? Maybe connect with you. What's that look like? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you can Google me and find out some things. But um, if you Google me, it's uh, Randy Brown Butler University because that's where I spend my time now. But LinkedIn is probably the best place. That's right. And a special shout out to Randy. He has taken on a volunteer capacity that probably exceeds most folks' full-time jobs. He's working with the undergrads at Butler and some of the grad students as well. Really cool thing that he's doing. So I just want to give him a special shout out for that. Well, you, you're, uh, you rock, Anthony, because... The truth of the matter is it's because of uh, students I get to meet graduate, undergraduate like you, that it, it just, it's a, it's a gift that gives right back to me. So thank you. Well, thanks, Randy. Again, appreciate you on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Special thanks to Randy for being on this episode of the show and breaking down how you can potentially get some more money in your pocket. Hopefully this has been of value to you and there's a good chance it could be of value to someone that you care about. So share it with them. Let them know that these are the types of steps that they can take to, to make an improvement in their financial lives uh, by making more money. And uh, I think that's a general benefit to most people. So if you've got any ideas for future topics on the show, any future guests you want to see, anything you want me to cover, leave me a comment down below. And as always, hit the subscribe button and the like button so that YouTube knows to share this video worth uh, Worth watching to other people. Uh, Randy really brought it, and so this could be a lot of benefit to a lot of folks. Hopefully that happens. And as always, you can check out the podcast by searching Anthony Drew Gary or The How To Show on the podcast player of your choice. And if you are looking to sell your house in the Indianapolis market, I can help you with that. Get in touch with me in the comments or at IndieDwell.com. You can find it in the show notes as well. Until next time, this is Anthony Drew Gary, host of the How To Show, signing off.